All right, good afternoon. Welcome to Senate Education. It's Friday, February 4th, 132. Uh, I think we have a relatively uh, light afternoon. We're gonna jump into S219, S219 for a little bit. We have Ms. Yang from uh, Human Rights Commission and talk about our, our most updated draft with Ledge Council. And then we're gonna spend some time uh, on S139. Uh, this is returning to our uh, bill on team mascots where we are gonna hear from uh, Ledge Council. And I don't know, did we hear from um, Chief Sheehan, uh, Daphne? We have not heard from him yet. Okay, so, so it might just be uh, Ms. St. James. So. I think we'll have a pretty light afternoon on this snowy Friday. But with that, Ms. Yang, great to see you. Haven't seen you in a while. I think it's probably been about a year. Uh, hope you're doing well. I am. How are you all? Thank you so much for inviting me back. Yeah, no, it's great to have you here. So, uh, you know, we're looking at S219, S219, which I'm sure you're familiar with by now. And uh, wondering if you could give us some feedback um, or any thoughts or any concerns uh, as we move in this direction. Yeah, so thank you. Uh, just for the record, my name is Bor Yang. I'm the executive director of the Vermont Human Rights Commission and we enforce the anti-discrimination laws of this state. And that includes housing, state government employment and places of public accommodations. And uh, so the Vermont Public Accommodations Law defines places of public accommodations to include the word schools. And I think the plain meaning of that term is pretty self-evident. We have always taken the position that school means all schools in the state of Vermont that is generally open to kids, to students. Uh, that includes K through 12, college, secular, religious, public, independent schools. I don't necessarily think that the term is ambiguous. Um, I know that there has been some discussions, um, both maybe in your committee and outside of your committee about whether or not the Public Accommodations Act covers religious schools or independent schools. Uh, my opinion is that it does and that there's no ambiguity in the law, um, but it's just my opinion. <laughs> and um, so the fact that there's conversations about it means that maybe there is an opportunity here to clarify that the legislature always intended that word to truly mean what it is. Uh, and it captures all schools. Um, the reason why I think it's not ambiguous is because if you look at uh, the exemptions that are in the statute, the canons of statutory construction tell us that when one thing is specifically expressed in a statute, statute, there's an inference that the legislature intended to exclude others uh, that are omitted from the statute. Here, the legislature carved out an exception for religious organizations from having to provide services or accommodations or facilities related to the solemnization of a marriage or celebration of marriage. We have to believe that the legislature, when they enacted this law knew that they could have carved out the same exception for religious schools and yet did not choose to do that. On the other hand, I would say that the people who say that the law is a little bit confusing might also say that we have intent language in the Public Accommodations Act that says our law should be construed consistently with the Americans with Disabilities Act. And the Americans with Disabilities Act does exempt religious organizations, including religious schools. So if that creates confusion, I certainly think it wouldn't necessarily hurt for us to clarify the Public Accommodations Act that school means really all schools. Uh, again, my, I don't think that's necessary, but that's just my opinion. Um, I would say, and the commission generally supports this bill. I, we're not necessarily going to take a position on the public tuition piece of it. I do think there's some really good language here that we like, uh, specifically the, um, language regarding uh, the provisions that outline conditions of eligibility for approved independent schools. We like that schools should be adopting implementing policies and procedures to comply with our anti-discrimination laws. 
we like that uh, schools should post uh, these policies and procedures on their website in prominent places to comply with our laws. Um, and I also really appreciated the language in the current draft around students who belong in uh, the, who are part of the IEP plans. I think my only question is, uh, I don't think that you intend, I don't know, to exclude other kids with disabilities who would fall, who are not um, in special education, but who would otherwise uh, need accommodations or could otherwise be excluded. Um, kids with disabilities could seek reasonable accommodations even if they're not part of any plan. And then there is a select group of kids who are not in special education, but who receive accommodations as part of the Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. So those are, they have what's called a 504 plan. And um, I think I would just like to see consistency or clarity about making sure that all kids with disabilities, whether they are in special education or not, would be protected uh, under this law. And that that exclusion isn't on purpose. Um, other than that, that really is my, um, my, my thoughts uh, on behalf of the commission. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Okay, uh, terrific. Uh, Senator Lyons. First, it's great to see you and thanks for being here. Um, do, you have, do you have your testimony in writing? Is it possible that we could get that? Sure. I just haven't had the time lately, but I will get no, it. No, that's you, okay. We understand the time issue. <laughs> yeah, I will. Yep. I'll write something up and send it your way. Okay. Is it, the 504 plan that is being developed and these kids that you're talking about, can you just give us an example of the type of child who might be um, under a 504 plan? Sure. You might have a child that needs medication. And because of a certain disability. And so they are not, they don't qualify to be in special education, but they need a plan in place for the school nurse or teachers to abide by. Uh, you have kids who have are, um, you might have students who are hard of hearing and they need accommodations around their hearing disability. And uh, that might be captured in a 504 plan. It's not always captured, but it ought to be captured in a 504 plan. And so um, that's how schools are on notice and are on alert that they have to accommodate a certain disability. So that kid wouldn't be in an IEP plan but they would still need accommodations. It is possible that schools may not necessarily want to accommodate kids who are receiving medication. It's possible that schools may not want to accommodate kids who need additional assistive devices. And so we want to make sure that those kids are not excluded either. And there are kids who have disabilities who may not be on any part of a plan, even though maybe they ought to be, right? A kid who's in a wheelchair, uh, and just really needs to use a bathroom that is accessible. A school uh, that is inclusive and thoughtful will accommodate that. They may not necessarily put that in a plan, but we wanna make sure that those kids also are receiving uh, their, the necessary accommodations to access that school. Thank you, that, that's really helpful. So th these kids, do you, uh, is it your understanding that um, both uh, disabled children and the, those under the 504 plan uh, would be eligible for Medicaid um, support, uh, education Medicaid support. Do we know? I don't know. That's a okay. great question. Yeah. I'm not sure. Okay. It's not an issue, probably not a question for us here, but I was just curious if you knew. Okay. Student that uh, has seizures, for example, might fall into that category. Yeah. Okay. All right. Senator Chittenden, did you have your hand up earlier? Um, but Senator Hooker probably has a better question. I'll go after. Oh, I don't know if it's better. I just, <laughs> hi, Bohr. It's good to see hi. you. Um, <clears throat> I just want a clarification on the American with, Americans with Disabilities Act. You talked about a carve out for religious schools. 
Yeah, it, it carves out religious entities under the public accommodations law. Um, and that might include when a religious entity creates a school, controls a school as well, that's open to members or non-members of that religious entity. So the ADA sort of does carve that piece out. I, I want to say that our public accommodations laws in Vermont has always been more encompassing than the public accommodations law under the fe under the federal law. Our federal, I'm sorry, our public accommodations law uh, defines places of public accommodations as any place that provides goods and services to the general public. And that isn't just commercial entities, but that's schools and hospitals. And we have case law in Vermont that says also any governmental entity. We had a case in which uh, the Department of Corrections had argued that they were close to the general public and therefore the inmates were not um, like they didn't have to necessarily follow the public accommodations law. And the court said, no, if you're a government entity, you are open to the general public. And so it opened the door to inmates bringing claims of public accommodations violation as well. Um, and so I just wanna say that, yes, we have that intent language at the beginning of the Public Accommodations Act that says this law should be construed consistently with the Americans with Disabilities Act. But we also have you know, exemptions within our own laws that specifically set out that religious organizations are exempted in, in relation to the solemnization of marriage. So I read that to mean that our legislature could have carved out an exception for religious schools if they wanted to, they chose not to. Um, and that means that, you know, schools mean schools, all schools. But when there's so much conversation around ambiguity and whether that word is ambiguous, I don't think it's ambiguous, but when there's conversations about that, it doesn't hurt to clarify that that's what you mean. That that, that, that word schools means all schools. Yeah. Senator Chindon. This is a very helpful testimony and it's great to hear that you like the language and the intent and the direction we're going. And I, I too, I think this is very well worth our, our doing. We did receive testimony from individuals that everybody on this committee highly respect that cautioned us on acting now before the Macon decision comes out and before additional court, uh, court decisions are known this summer and so on. Do you have any thoughts on the timing of this in, in, con in contrast with what we are waiting for from the Supreme Court? Yeah, um, I'm going to... I'm gonna cheat a little bit and say that <laughs> I'm, I'm not necessarily gonna take a position on the speediness of this. I think that as a lawyer, I think it might make sense to wait so that you can create a law that sort of addresses specifically what is gonna happen at the Supreme Court level and those second circuit court cases. On the other hand, I also think there are many kids waiting for this body to make a decision that guides local schools and guides uh, the agency of education and school boards on discrimination and public tuition dollars. And so I think there are two competing, uh, really both valid reasons here. And um, I, I, I'm, I'm not unfortunately gonna guide you one way or the other, but they're both compelling. Thank you. Senator Perslick. Thank you. And thank you, Ms. Yang. And on that last point, I know you, you just said you were going to uh, take a position on that, but could you give us what your legal view is of the danger of acting early? So on this, on your latter point, the compelling argument about the students that are waiting and that we, I think as a committee and the legislature want to, want to act this way, but we're told, oh, wait, because you can do a better law if you know what the decision is. What's the danger if we're off a little bit I guess one danger that you can confirm is that we'd be open for a lawsuit, but could we then change it or could we, are we precluded kind of from a legal defense perspective from changing it after the making decision comes out? Does that make sense as a question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think you can always change it. I, 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 there, I don't know if there's a danger so much as um, putting a lot of time and energy into something that may later need to be corrected. And obviously the danger, I mean, it's not a danger, but this is the end of the biennium. 
And will you all, you know, be here who understood why this bill came about and what is the purpose of the next week? I often feel like I'm in testifying in a different committee in the House where there's a conversation about why wasn't the current bill added to a bill that was passed two years ago. And I'm having, having to explain that's just the way you all work, right? I can't, it wasn't intentional. You pass one bill and now this is a bill that needs to catch up to that. But now people think that was on purpose. Right. And so you're you're trying to. Yes, I think that's the 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 danger is you are a great group of people who care about our kids, who want to make sure that all of our kids are included and really have choice whether or not they don't have to be straight and cisgender and able bodied uh, without any disabilities in order to have real choice. And I think. You know, I think that's an important message to send. Um, I just think, yes, you're devoting a lot of time and energy to something that could end up being overturned or could, you know, is it possible that the case law comes down and you could have created a much more um, powerful law in this, in, in 219, right? To address uh, the guy, the guideline that the court, like the order that the, the is issued by the court, right? So that's, that's, I think that, that mostly is it, but you know that. Yes, yeah, Senator Chin. So follow up on this very good point. So thank you for that. And I agree that in the broader long-term context, all of our actions are ephemeral. Um, I'm wondering if you, since we're all here now and we might not be here next year and this group of people think that we should do this, do you think uh, splitting the atom or finding a middle ground would be to proceed with passing a bill, but set an effective date for after the next uh, biennium's first year so that the next legislature, whoever's sitting in these seats, if they would make an advice, can then adjust course. Is there merit in considering that? Yeah, I mean, certainly. I, I think that just depends if, um, which by the way, I'm sure you'll all be back. I just wanna say, <laughs> I just wanna say that. But um, certainly I think it just requ it requires that the chair of this committee recognize that and know that, and that know that that has to be revisited based on this case law. So, so long as there's sort of that passing of information, I could see that that might make, um, that might make sense. But um, yeah, again, I, I, I'm not sure that waiting or not waiting is necessarily the best. Uh, any other questions for uh, Ms. Yang? I, I, yes, I guess Senator Hooker. Following up on Senator Chittenden's question about um, putting the effective date off, do we know when Macon is going to be decided? I mean, can we? No. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. I mean, I, I think whether the effective date is, you know, upon passage or a, a a few years from now, the same, the same kind of work, the same kind of questions would be asked to make the necessary adjustments. Um, yeah. Yeah, Senator Lyons. No, okay. No, I'm fine, thank you. Okay. Just uh, okay. thinking through it. I think, you know, I think uh, putting it off because of a court case, well, the next, we put it off and then there'll be another court case and, uh, <laughs> So I think the interest of kids, the compelling interest of kids is uh, more important for me at this point, but that, that's part of our discussion. That's not part of Boar's uh, testimony necessarily, but her testimony is compelling. <laughs> it's good. Ms. Yang, any other final comments from you? No, I just wanna thank you for um, really uh, introducing a bill and taking up a bill that is really important and recognizes that there are many kids left out of having real choice in the state of Vermont. And um, thank you. And if you, uh, just following up on Senator Lyon's request, if you would be so kind as to send us some written testimony, that way we can <clears throat> make sure your comments uh, are well considered and likely incorporated into the bill. Yep, absolutely. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Demaray. Good afternoon. How are you? Good, how are you? 
Good. So are we reviewing a new copy or is there anything uh, we, last we saw was the copy with the, the, the blue highlights, if Correct. you will. And, um, and I think this committee has, uh, I think, you know, I, I don't think we're moving in that direction, uh, but people are certainly willing to speak up. So um, any, any updates really from you, any decision points that you need uh, decided from us, Jim? Well, aside from that one aside area that. in blue, yeah. um, no. no um, and uh, I just wanted to respond to a few of the comments made by um, uh, by Bohr, if that's okay. Please. Um, so a few things, um, just to give you some assurance about what your draft does. Um, first of all, the, the question about whether the Public Accommodations Act covers schools. Um, the ambiguity doesn't lie in the word school. Um, school is a very clear term. Um, but what the um, act does is it uh, defines place of public accommodation to mean a school, restaurant, store, et cetera, uh, at which services are offered to the general public. And the question, therefore, is around whether the services are, op are offered to the general public. And that's all about admission policies. Um, you know, how how wide is your catchment? So it's a fact and circumstance test, which is why in my mind, it's not 100% clear whether this law applies to all schools. Therefore, your bill says in order to receive public tuition, uh, the independent schools, uh, including religious and secular, would have to comply with this Public Accommodations Act as if they were public schools. Um, so, and that's true too for anti-discrimination law. So if there's a question about disabilities, um, you have to comply with the laws that apply to public schools. So wherever might be vague about those laws is intended by this bill to be made certain for these schools that take public tuition. So I'm sorry, did you say it, it's made vague by this bill? Yeah, wherever it might be vague, in terms wherever of it might the, be vague, the, yes. Whether those other laws apply yes. or not, yes. your bill makes them apply okay. because they have to operate as if they're a public school in terms of not discriminating against right. anyone. Right. So hopefully that helps. The other thing is um, uh, let's pause uh, there. Any questions for Jim right now on that piece? Okay. Uh, Senator yeah. Hooker. Uh, I just want to go back to the like the definition of open to the public and you know public schools are obviously open to the public i mean they take they have to take everybody independent schools they don't do they you know only accept applications i mean i know that the acceptance is um critical here but people can apply right so it's right so I'm sure. sort of open on that end. You can apply, but whether you are accepted or not is the question. Um, how broad your public schools have to take every student? No. Uh, wait right? one second on that, Jim. Is that a, are we sure that that is one hundred percent accurate? Yeah. Because I, I do recall some testimony last year of saying that, okay, maybe, yes, but maybe what they did was sometimes they would redirect a student, you know, a student with, you know, perhaps a severe social emotional issue that they really felt as though they could not accommodate. They then maybe, maybe it's then through advice that they're, they're doing this and saying to parents, you know, yes, uh, like you're saying, you're, you're welcome to come to this, to this school, but we may not be able to accommodate. That's so, okay. so for ch children who are like on IEP, yes. special education, for example, um, the supervisory union, which is the so-called LEA, local yeah. education authority, um, is responsible for placing the child in um, uh, providing a public, uh, public education at no cost in a least restrictive environment for that child. That might require a placement into another program, school, you know, whatever. 
but the schools have to accept the kids. The school public schools have to accept the kids. Uh, if they're placed there, they have to accept the kids. Okay. If they if they live there, they have okay. to accept the kids. Okay. Um, Great. For a private school, take a private religious school, for example. Yeah. That might be a let's just say a Christian school. Um, they might have more selective criteria uh, kids in terms of who they accept, and so therefore, I don't. I can't tell you for sure that all schools um, serve the general public. I just can't say that. It has to be looked at, I think, on a case-by-case basis, um, looking at how they admit kids. So that's why there's some ambiguity, and that's why your bill tries to solve that by saying it doesn't matter if it's ambiguous over there. If you're taking public money, you have to comply with those laws. Um, So that's what your bill uh, does. The other thing, um, Carol, Ray, Senator Hooker, is that clear to you? I just want to make sure you're you're okay. Yeah. yeah okay. I, okay. I think it is. I'm just trying to get to the idea of you know, how does a school not be a, how can a school not be a public, you know, open to the public if they're accepting applications from anyone unless they, if they. Um, and they're not. Certain, so they're not. It's when they do that's when the public dollars come into play and then the uh, and then the Public Accommodations Act comes into play. Is that accurate, Jim? Yeah, a much more clear example for you, Senator Hooker, is not school so much, but think of like the Elks Club or a club. Mm-hmm. Um, typically, the, the cases are in that area because clubs can be quite selective, all men, all women, or wherever they might be. And there are a bunch of cases around whether they uh, because they have selective criteria, are subject to the public accommodations law, right? Um, so it's the same sort of analysis for these schools. Obviously, the schools have a broader, probably a broad, broader acceptance um, policy than maybe a private club does. But there are some restrictions on that for some schools, and therefore the question is a valid question to raise, and your bill addresses that question. Thank you. Okay. Senator Chittenden. So my comment was somewhat on this point is my understanding is that a private institution can still be a public or a place of public accommodation. I, I don't know if that goes to your question, Cheryl, but I think of Costco is a private institution or at the Elks Club, but it is still a place of public accommodation, just like a public school um, doesn't, you can't just walk into a public school, like the, the doors are locked, uh, but it is a, a place of public accommodation. So it abides by these rules. I'm seeing yeah. Jim nod. That makes me happy, which means I understand what he's talking about. Yeah, good. Okay. No, that is, that's helpful. It's, it's in the Senator Perchley, you're leaning in. I was just going to say, I was disappointed that Senator Chin didn't, didn't use the example of the Victory Club. I was hoping that we'd hear. What is, what is, remind me again, the Victory Club, that's just something for Chittenden County senators. Exclusive. I'm not a member. Exclusive. But Exclusive. At the hockey. Lion, is Lions UVM a member? UVM hockey. I, no. Okay. Nope. All right. All right. I, I don't. I don't know anything about it. I. I don't. So I am. I'm in uh, new territory. Um. Okay, Jim. Please. So please. The second point that Bor raised, I want to respond to, is she mentioned the fact that the bill has language that these these independent schools, if they take public tuition, have to take kids on uh, IEP, okay? And she said, well, why not a 504 plan? Why not just a disability? Um, I believe we've got that covered more or less through our language already, because they have to comply with the laws that apply to public schools in terms of taking kids with disabilities. But the reason why the law, the bill is drafted around Um, special ed students is the grand bargain that was reached three years ago or so um, when Senator Baruth chaired this committee. And um, there was a summer study committee trying to find find ways in which to get these independent schools to take on special education students. And they agreed to take that category of students under various conditions that were written into Act 173. So what this bill is doing is it's taking that already agreed upon language that was developed in Act 173, and it's making it's just putting it into this into your bill. So 
you you have two conditions that you're adding. Um, you're saying you have to not discriminate and you have to um, not use funds for these purposes. And the third thing from Act 173 is you have to take LA, L, you have to take students on an IEP if they're placed by the supervisory union union for that student. So that's the third element, but that third element was already there before from Act 173. So for example, if if uh, a supervisory union believes that St. John's Mary St. John's Mary Academy is the spot for the student yep. with an IEP, they need to take that student. Yes. Okay. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Correct. And yep. this grand bargain was signed by uh, this was sounds to me like it was a conversation between this committee. I do remember, and also our academies and independent schools. Yeah, uh, the independent okay. schools were on that committee, and they okay. they all kind of agreed to this, and that's where it stands on the same board of rules, yeah. which was drafted, are about to go into effect for this. Right. Uh, um, well, I'm not sure about to, but they're being drafted for, for this purpose. You know, how this works. I believe the House is working on that, yeah. yeah. Anything else, Mr. Demaray? Uh, well, the House is looking at possibly delaying the special education change from reimbursement to census grant, delay uh, that, right. right? On this question, I don't think there's a, a debate there happening okay. about timing. Senator Pursley. Um, can you just tell me more about, is that a bill that the House is doing? That just caught my ear that they're talking about delaying the census grant. Is that in is something bigger, like they're working a whole bunch I, of stuff? Or? I'm not sure whether they're, they're, they, they, there's been talk about that. There's been strong testimony by a number of school districts over there that they don't want a delay. Um, so I'm not sure they're going to delay that. Um, there's another rule that um, State Board has about um, determining when um, there's an adverse effect on a child, which is part of the determination for special education. Right. And, and that's a different role. And there's some debate about that rule and whether that should be delayed. But that's kind of separate from the big switch from reimbursement to census. Right. Um, but it was, a, it was a rule that came out of Act 173, and it's going through the rulemaking process. It's, and it's in front of LCAR now or upcoming, is my understanding. Correct. Yeah. But the House is thinking about kind of interjecting and saying, hold up, possibly on the rule implementation. I, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure if they're really thinking about that. They're okay. thinking some testimony on that question. So, yeah. yeah. And I, I didn't, so even though LCAR may be working on it, they may be half, three quarters of the way done, that it's the legislature can interrupt that process. Yeah. Well, we're talking about two different rules here. Uh, the rules that um, deal with, um, moving from reimbursement to census, that's right. okay. That sorry, we're talking about huh, yeah. So, so the rules we're talking about here are the twenty two hundred series, which is the rules for approving independent schools. Mm -hmm. That's the one that was we're, we're talking about that's in play right now for sure. Then there's a separate rule on this adverse effect thing, um, and. That's separate from, from the independent school approval stuff. I'm not sure where that one stands, but that's where there's been some conversation about whether that needs more time. That, that, that change in definition of adverse effect might need more time. I don't know where that's going, but just to say it's in, in, in conversation. Just so the, the committee knows, I've been contacted about that. And so I looked into it a little bit and it looked like it was on LCAR's like the rule was written, but LCAR hasn't acted yet, but I don't know if it's on their agenda. But the, a lot of the same people that had contacted me about literacy were worried about a delay. <laughs> they thought it was gonna be helping these children. The, the implement, implementation of that rule was a central part of Act 173 about these, and specifically the children with learning disabilities. So they were, they were worried about delaying it, so. Jim, can you get us some more information from Rep Web on that? Or, 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 you know, what they might be thinking. Um, sure, I can ask her. Yeah. Okay. That, 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 I, I think I think they're having some conversations early next week, so I'm not quite sure. Okay. It might be a few days into next week before I can get back to you. Okay. Thank you, Senator Lyons. Um, I'm just trying to remember what's happening on LCAR. Um, I 
I'm, I'm trying to remember if that rule was postponed, if we've even gotten it yet on our agenda. But um, if a rule comes up and we, we can ask for an extension or we can, the, the agency can ask for an extension on any rule. If a rule is not approved by LCAR, it goes into, uh, it is active anyway, uh, but then it's open for um, a challenge. So I don't know, I, I honestly can't remember. We don't have an LCAR meeting for another couple of weeks. Uh, we didn't have one this week, so. But I don't know if that helps or not, but I can, I'll look and see where it is on, uh, when I look at my LCAR papers, maybe a little bit later, I'll check it. I can send you the rule number two. Yeah, uh, yeah, no, I'll, I'll have it, but you know, go ahead, that'd be helpful. So Mr. Demaray, I think what uh, would be helpful to us is seeing a 4.1 uh, version of the bill uh, yep. with, with, um, uh, without the uh, highlighted section, clean okay, copy, yep. and yep. that way we can start to uh, get close to finalizing it, start to share something with colleagues uh, and others. Yep, okay. So if you would uh, plan to take us through that uh, Tuesday or Wednesday. Yeah, I'm out Tuesday, so it has to oh, be yeah. so Wednesday. Right. Whatever yes. works for you, yeah. honestly. Okay. Yep. I, think, yep. I think we're in good shape. Good. Okay. Uh, in terms of, uh, okay. Um, okay, any other comments from you, Jim? Not from me, no. Okay, any other?